By way of preface, I should say that uh, these remarks were prepared originally for an honors convocation at Holy Cross College, and so there'll be some allusions made to that fact. Among the old movies that now and then turn up on late night television, one of my favorites is The Magnificent Seven. Though I could quite easily hum for you the wonderful musical soundtrack, I will spare you that dubious pleasure. <laughs> the film, which starred Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen, was a shoot 'em up western based very roughly on a medieval Japanese saga about self sacrificing samurai warriors. Seven out of work professional gunfighters from Texas are hired for a pittance to defend an impoverished Mexican village from the depredations of a particularly nasty bandito. The movie displays the predictable violence and mayhem of the genre, as well as the sentimentally characteristic of the films of that era. Thus, the seven American killers are portrayed as really nurturing within their bosoms, hearts of gold. The end is also predictable. The villain is dispatched in an orgy of gun smoke and blood, and the heroes ride off into the sunset. In the history of Holy Cross College, indeed in the history of South Bend and the state of Indiana and in innumerable other sites across America, another seven left a magnificent, enduring testament. And these were not, like the characters in the film, figments of a screenwriter's fancy or, if you prefer, symbols of the late 20th century's nostalgia for a simpler, less morally ambiguous time. I refer, of course, to the seven men who, after a suitably moving religious ceremony, departed Le Mans on August 5th, 1841, the Feast of Our Lady of the Snows, a token of special meaning for them later, when they found themselves ensconced within the wintry confines of Northwest Indiana. Departed Le Mans for Le Havre in Normandy and the voyage to the New World. One can do no better than to call off the roll of honor. Edward Soren, 27 years of age, priest and superior. Jean Pio, renamed in religion Brother Vincent, 44. Guillaume Michel André, Brother Joachim, 32. Jean Ménage, Brother Lawrence, 26. René Patois, Brother Francis Xavier, 21. Pierre K.O., Brother Anselm, 15. And Urbain Monzime, Brother Gation, also 15. These were the men of Holy Cross whom the founder of the congregation, Basil Moreau, on that fateful August day, dispatched for service in the Diocese of Vincennes, Indiana, on the far-off American frontier. Of this magnificent seven, one, Father Soren, has received, as surely has been his due, appropriate recognition. The founder of Notre Dame, and indeed of so many apostolates, educational and otherwise, that have flourished across the United States under the aegis of Holy Cross, deserves all the accolades he has received over the years. Without his leadership, without his incorrigible optimism, his iron will, his willingness to take risks without, and here we enter a private and terribly sensitive and personal spiritual realm, without his sublime trust that providence, and more specifically, that Our Lady had set aside for Holy Cross in America and for him in particular a mission, all might have gone down whistling with the wind. But such an acknowledgement does not for a moment rule out the impact of those who were auxiliary to him, indeed those without whose unselfish devotion he would never have achieved what he did. And chief among such confederates were those who first accompanied Soren to the New World. That is why I have entitled these remarks The Magnificent Six. A double background needs elaboration. All seven of the Holy Cross pioneers hailed from the departments of Sarth and Mayenne that comprised the enormous diocese of Le Mans. Here in the west of France, a sharp religious revival followed the fall of Napoleon in 1815. One sign of renewed fervor was the campaign to restore the system of parochial schools that had been destroyed by the bloody persecutions mounted by the revolution of 1789 
and hardly less so by the suffocating Erastianism of the Napoleonic regime. One prime mover in this endeavor was a priest named Jacques Dujarrier, who in 1820 founded in his parish the Brothers of St. Joseph. These well-intentioned, though meagerly trained, teachers spread rapidly throughout the region. Meanwhile, in Le Mans, a young seminary professor, Basil Moreau, had organized some of his colleagues into a group known informally as auxiliary priests, whose function it was to act in support of pastors across the diocese who, for whatever reason, stood in need of temporary assistance. As Dujarrier's health gradually failed, and the very existence of his band of brothers became problematic, the Bishop of Le Mans determined to join organically the Brothers of St. Joseph with the auxiliary priests under Father Moreau as director. The bishop intended this amalgamated society to perform as a diocesan institute. Moreau saw it as the seed of a religious order in service of the universal church. The dispute between these two strong-minded men raged for many years. Moreau's side of it carried on from his headquarters in the Le Mans suburb Saint Croix, Holy Cross. Across the Atlantic, 3,000 miles away, Celestin Hélandier, Bishop of Vincennes, also a native of Western France, was in desperate need of teaching brothers to staff the system of primary schools he was attempting to set up. He appealed to Moreau, who, anxious to establish the credentials of his fledgling congregation outside the jurisdiction of Le Mans, eventually complied. So it was that the seven set out on that August day in 1841 upon their great adventure. The trek to the American frontier took them 66 days. They traveled by ocean packet, riverboat, canal barge, across Lake Erie in a newfangled steamship, and from Toledo overland, mostly by foot on barely passable roads through woods and bogs until they finally reached the Wabash. None of them could speak a word of English, and so it was in French that they expressed their joy at the end of the perilous journey. We have seen Vincennes, the Vincennes that we had so much desire to see, that we have talked about so much, and our entry into this other Jerusalem makes us feel something of what the elect of God must feel upon their entrance into heaven. Two of the brothers, Helandier, retained in Vincennes to teach in his school there, though, given the language barrier, their effectiveness was limited at best. Soren and the other four he assigned to a mission 25 miles to the east at Black Oak Ridge, near the site of the present town of Washington. They remained there for 14 dispiriting months, during which a serious rift opened between them and the bishop. In virtue of the constitutions Father Moreau had drawn up for the congregation, it was required that each community be headed by a priest. And though Helandier considered Soren a kind of bonus, an unanticipated addition to the small number of priests available to serve in his huge diocese, it was the brothers he really wanted and he wanted to control them. Of course, in Soren and his six companions, he found stern antagonists. The result was a running quarrel, not unlike that going on at the same time in France between Moreau and the Bishop of Le Mans. Finally, after much heated rhetoric, Helandier, as much to send them as far away as possible from himself as for any loftier reason, offered the men of Holy Cross a tract of land he owned in the northwest corner of his diocese, close to the south bend of the St. Joseph River. The Episcopal condition for this largesse was that a college and a brother's novitiate be established there within two years. Maybe the bishop thought his stipulation could not be met, in which case the land would revert to him, or at least Holy Cross might learn proper docility. If he did think so, he was sorely mistaken. The composition of the first colony of Holy Cross in America demonstrates Basil Moreau's intention to set up a permanent, well-rounded, self-sustaining community. The youngsters, Anselm and Gation, would be the first teachers Bishop Helandier wanted, 
on the assumption that they would more easily learn English than their older brethren. The middle-aged Vincent, however, also had much ca classroom experience dating back to the days of his association with Abbe Dujarier. Joachim was a tailor by trade and a cook by necessity. He was the first of the group to die, succumbing to tuberculosis two years after the arrival at Notre Dame. Francis Xavier was a carpenter and indeed a jack of all trades, whose many skills were put to use over half a century. In contrast to Joachim, he outlived all his companions and continued to work unabated till the eve of the new century. Though all seven, including Soren, had sprung from rural backgrounds, Lawrence possessed the most reliable reputation as a successful farmer. This was a crucial advantage because it was taken for granted that the community, if it were to survive, had to produce its own food and fiber, and if it were to prosper, had also to offer commodities on the market. The failure of the first crop at Black Oak Ridge simply underscored this imperative. A stout, burly, imperturbable man, Brother Lawrence, as manager of the extensive Notre Dame farms, with their fields of maize and wheat, with their swine and cattle, and orchards of peach and apple tree, fulfilled these requirements with aplomb. Indeed, there was no task assigned this phlegmatic religious which was not performed with serene efficiency. When he died in 1873, Father Soren said of him, we sustain a serious loss which none can realize better than myself. Although I have seen more than many other men of my age, religious of undoubted fidelity, of great zeal, none I would place above Brother Lawrence. If anyone is to be named and persevering efforts of mind and body to the development and prosperity of Notre Dame, it was he. As to myself personally, I lose a friend who never refused me any sacrifice. Without doubt, the most poignant and even tragic fortune endured by any of the Magnificent Six was that of Pierre Caillot, Brother Anselm. From the time of their arrival in Indiana, he found himself divorced from the rest of the community, a circumstance which was especially cruelly felt by this sensitive teenager. Even after the rest of Holy Cross had moved to the north, Anselm was left to teach in Vincennes, a kind of hostage to the semi-psychotic Bishop Halandier. Nor was Edward Soren, in Anselm's case, a very supportive superior. To be sure, he, Soren, insisted that, I wish Anselm to eat something at four o'clock after his class, and I don't want him in a humid room. But this sort of long distance concern was small consolation to Anselm, who wanted and needed the community life to which he had committed himself at Saint Croix. His superior showed little solace or forbearance. Anselm, Soren reported to Moreau, was the only one among the brothers who had not measured up to the needs of the mission. Due, Soren said, to his weak personality, fragile health, contrary spirit, and bad judgment. Months after this adverse notice duly registered in the files at Le Mans, Anselm was at last delivered from the direct bullying of Celestine Hélandière. But even then, he was not allowed to join his brethren at Notre Dame. Instead, he was assigned to assist in a parochial school conducted by a friendly pastor in Madison, a town located in the extreme southeast corner of Indiana on the Ohio River. In the summer of 1845, the boy drowned in that river in a swimming accident. His demise is a reminder that for all his accomplishments, Edward Soren was not without the faults to which religious superiors are sometimes prone. Unquestionably, the most fascinating among the brothers who accompanied Soren to America was Anselm's contemporary, Urbain Mosimé, Brother Gation. And he was also by far the most naturally gifted. He became fluent in English within months of arrival, and he proved over the nine years of his participation in the community a brilliant classroom teacher, 
across a wide spectrum of disciplines. But during those same years, he showed himself to be a bundle of contradictions. Sharply intelligent as he was, he nonetheless regularly indulged in intrigue and gossip, routinely complaining to Moreau by secret dispatch about the shortcomings of his superiors and his confreres. And yet, at the same time, he did not hesitate to demonstrate the courage of his convictions by confronting Soren directly, which few of his colleagues were bold enough to do. Many instances of such brashness might be cited, but here is one that has survived in written form from February 1849. Permit me to speak frankly. You generally do things only by halves, and you require real miracles from your subjects, and then blame them when these miracles are not really wrought. If I were to retrieve your affairs, as I have some hope of doing, it will be the result of my innate capacity and energy. I don't see, Reverend Father Superior, how you manage to be continually getting yourself and others into scrapes. This indictment, the effrontery, no doubt, of the cocksureness of a clever youth, was, however, not without a basis in fact. In the early years, Father Soren did indeed stretch the scanty resources of the community, often to the breaking point. A bizarre and tragic confirmation for both of them came only months later. Desperate for funds to keep Notre Dame afloat, Soren decided to mount an expedition to the California gold fields. He put the stolid brother Lawrence in overall charge and assigned the literate brother Gation as secretary treasurer. And they, along with brother Placid, the community's 38-year-old baker, and several laymen set out for the Sacramento Valley. Their quest for quick riches, like that of so many of the 49ers, ended in bleak and bitter disillusionment. Placid died, and Lawrence almost did, and not a penny resulted from the company's joint efforts. I have also been very sick for four weeks, Gation wrote Soren, and have run a debt of $60. But not only that. Though Lawrence eventually made his way back to Indiana, Gation stayed in California and formally resigned from Holy Cross. He drifted off to San Francisco, where, after an aimless decade, he wrote once more to Soren. I have lost all hope for recovery. Doctors have given me up, and I am becoming daily weaker. I weigh only 105 pounds. While he declared, with a deep regret and heartfelt sorrow, any disappointments my frankness may have caused you, and in spite of the inconceivable attachment which I have for your institution, Gation, being Gation, could not resist one last verbal barb. I die, I think, the victim of the wretched system followed in your institution in which no attention is paid to health. His one hope, a final return home, was fulfilled. But only weeks after he reached his father's farm in France, he died. He was 34 years old. Jean Pio, brother Vincent, by contrast, lived into his 94th year. And in also in contrast to the mercurial Gation, Vincent remained throughout his half century in the United States, a consistent source and symbol of integrity, steadfastness, and fidelity to his religious commitment. There seems little reason to doubt that Father Moreau assigned Vincent to the original Indiana mission precisely because of his maturity as a man and a religious. He was 17 years Edward Soren Sr., and he had been among the first brothers to join Jacques Dujarrier. Once their relationship had ripened, Soren cheerfully accorded Vincent the title of Patriarch of the Community, and indeed spoke of him often as the co-founder, along with himself, of Notre Dame and Holy Cross in America. But in the beginning, their relationship was not so cordial. During the first difficult year at Black Oak Ridge, Soren complained bitterly about his colleagues in general and about Vincent in particular. The brothers' ignorance of agricultural methods appropriate to the American Midwest had been responsible, he charged, for the failure of the harvest of 1842. As for Vincent, 
I am forced to observe and report to you, Soren wrote Moreau, that poor Brother Vincent supports me only slightly and has almost no foresight or memory. Behind this rather petulant observation was Soren's resentment that Moreau had intended Brother Vincent to keep a vigilant eye on the much younger man. And indeed, Vincent did not hesitate to admonish occasionally his unseasoned and impulsive chief, though he did so without the hostility habitually shown by Gatian. I find you rather often, he once told Soren, too reserved with your assistance. I do not think you follow through on your plans. People complain that you do not observe the rules of the college. Such criticism from one who was by and large a gentle and accommodating man must have been hard to listen to. But Soren soon came to appreciate that Vincent's devotion to Holy Cross and its project in America was as fierce and firm as his own, that his mild rebukes intended service of that project without a scintilla of disloyalty or personal ambition. Indeed, his single stint as acting superior of the mission in New Orleans for several months in 1849 proved to be the dreariest experience of Vincent's religious life. You say in your last letter, he remarked to Soren, somewhat peevishly, that old brother Vincent ought to know how to give orders. I have never been able to. You knew that before sending me here. Do you think you'll be able to replace me soon? You must consider, my good father, that you have to replace me as soon as possible, or else you'll see this beautiful establishment decay little by little. The establishment in New Orleans, that it was ever beautiful remains highly debatable, did decay into heartbreaking bitterness and controversy, but through no fault of Brother Vincent. These thumbnail sketches do the Magnificent Six scant justice, but perhaps you will not think it inappropriate to salute them, even in this insufficient manner, on the occasion when we salute the honors students of this college which bears the same proud name they did. And even the northern Indiana weather of the past week or so has contrived to help us remember the sacrifices of a century and a half ago that have made this evening possible. Here are the words of Father Soren, already entered into his last illness when Brother Vincent died and only Brother Francis Xavier was left. The season in which we came, a long and severe winter of five months of constant snow, multiplied not a little our trials. Sometimes we found our beds in the morning covered with snow. What a fine preparation for meditation. Blessed are the poor, for they shall see God, not only in heaven, but even here upon the earth. Our little community was never so edifying. Our dear brothers, of whom only one remains, had to suffer God alone knows in how many ways, being obliged to take their night's rest on the bare floor. And yet, not a word of complaint. God's holy will was their comfort, the unfailing source of consolation and joy.